Okay, you guys, it's um, unit four, segment three notes, and we've already covered the causes of climate change, and now we're going to get into what the greenhouse effect is and the greenhouse gases. This is going to be a lengthy video. <laughs> Just brace it yourself. Um, the image here shows you have incoming energy coming in. This is high energy, short wavelength kind of energy. Once it hits the surface, it can do two things. It can be reflected, bounced back out the way it same um, energy that it came in. So if it was short wave, it goes back out as short wave, which is kind of illustrated with this arrow right here. Or it can be absorbed, um, which is then it takes in that energy and converts it into heat energy. And then it's radiated out where it then can be captured and re-radiated back toward the earth by the greenhouse gases. Not every greenhouse, not every gas, excuse me, is a greenhouse gas. So there are special characteristics about greenhouse gases that make them unique. They have the ability to capture that energy and convert it into heat energy. Whereas like nitrogen gas, N2, that makes up 80% of our atmosphere, that's not a greenhouse gas. So the energy goes right through it. But CO2, if that heat energy comes up, CO2 takes it in, absorbs it, and re-radiates it as more heat in all directions. And sometimes that direction is aimed down to the earth. So let's write some stuff down. We have short wave radiation coming in from the sun to the earth, to the earth system. And then the earth absorbs and radiates long wave radiation in the form of heat and infrared. So if it doesn't have a high albedo and it doesn't reflect, then it's going to absorb. We talked about that before. When it absorbs, it re-radiates it in long wave radiation, which is heat. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere absorb or catch the long wave radiation and then re-radiate it back down in all directions. So I picture it like catching a baseball and then throwing it back again. So it catches and throws it. Some radiation is sent back out to space, yes, but some is sent back down to Earth. And that's the radiation that builds up and creates that trapped energy and increases the Earth's temperatures. Okay? Um, each, now we're going to talk about each greenhouse gas, and we have little sections. We'll talk about what the, gra the gas is, and then we'll talk about what are the sources. So each gas will have sources, both natural and anthropogenic. Do you remember that word, anthropogenic? It means human, human cause, or from humans. Um, with carbon dioxide, we talked about the phrase carbon sink, and that's anywhere that will store carbon. So we have the ocean as a massive carbon sink. The lithosphere, which is the ground, the dirt, and the soil, um, stores carbon. Biosphere, atmosphere, all of those are carbon sinks, storing carbon. The natural sources of carbon are going to be decomposition, which we talked about before. Um, because they're natural, we're listing natural sources, so not human. So we have swamps and forests and things like that where you have leaves falling or debris falling to the bottom of the swamp and decomposing. And then we have cellular respiration. <laughs> Everything alive goes through cellular respiration and that is going to put out carbon dioxide. And then we have volcanoes that are releasing, degassing that, um, or outgassing that material, that's the carbon that's trapped in the rocks. Okay, so this is the graph that um, we talked a little bit about before. Um, with CO2, but we have today over here in this corner, and then we have we go back in time to 1880. On this side, we're looking at temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so this is our norm, and this is a deviation from the norm when we're down below, we're in a cooling state, and when we're above it, we're in warming. And then this on this side is the carbon dioxide levels in parts per million. So I just want you to look at this graph, and I want to. See, I want you to see if you can. Um, well, it's pretty obvious the connection that you have. You see here in front of you with the temperature and the carbon dioxide levels. They both are on the rise. Now the global temperature temperature has gone up and down in little peaks and valleys, um, because we know that the global temperature is impacted by many other factors, right? But we cannot deny the um, definite connection that we see here with this type of graph that. Carbon dioxide levels are on the rise as well as the temperature, making you connect the idea that there are, there's a reason for that. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and it does absorb that energy. Um, this is the same kind of graph, only much bigger time scale. And I like this graph because I like how far back it goes and what it, it's showing. 
So this was taken in the Antarctic. So we're down at the South Pole. This is present day, okay? And then we, have, we go all the way back more than 600,000 years ago. The yellow that you see there is the CO2 concentrations in Antarctica. So you're seeing these peaks and valleys, and it gives you the value in parts per million of what it was, and peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, so CO2 concentrations. Um, the red line that you see is showing the temperatures, which we can get from the ice core data. And you can see they really do follow these peaks and valleys. If you look closely, you can see that there are definitely um, direct, direct indicators that they are something is influenced, one of them is influencing the other, and since we know carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and takes in um, and reabsorbs that energy, we can only we can only draw the conclusion that that is a culprit. Now this orange right here, I showed you guys the Mauna Loa um, graph showing an increase in CO2 is very similar to the graph that you just saw a second ago. This right here, that, that's earlier information, so that's in the year 2006, so that's more, more recent. So it's just a tiny little blip on this, you guys, but the concentration that we are seeing is off the charts, and that's what's most astounding. This is off the charts. No other time in history has carbon dioxide levels ever been in this range, okay? So we have gone through ice ages, okay, and times of warmth and ice ages and times of warmth, we are off the charts on this. That's what that's what's kind of scary is that we could see this this change depending on how important CO2 is as a determinant for how warm we'll get. We could see this global warm. We're seeing it happen at such a rapid rate compared to times in history. More on carbon dioxide, anthropogenic sources, so humans were a cause. Right here's a satellite image of um, a fire. You can see that release. So burning fossil fuels through power plants or vehicles. We also contribute to decomposition with all of our landfills and we deforest the forests and we also have forest fire situations. We can cause those as well. I know lightning can cause that too um, and you can definitely list that as a natural cause as well. Okay, another greenhouse gas, one that's often overlooked because there's not much we can do about water vapor, but water vapor is actually the biggest greenhouse gas there is. It um, absorbs that energy and re-radiates it back down to earth. So the sources, you guys, are both are just natural mostly, and that's going to be from the surface water areas, lakes, rivers, streams, soil, animals, and, and plants. Another one is methane, CH4. Now, if you have um, decomposition happening without oxygen, you're not going to have CO2 being emitted because that contains an oxygen. Instead, you, ha you can have CH4, which is methane, which is why I showed a swamp here. So down, this is stagnant water. You don't get much churning. You don't get much oxygen put into this water. So down at the, in the bottom of this area, this swamp here, you have the swamp gas, this methane that's being made by the decomposing materials that drop down in there. So methane is made by decomposition without oxygen. It's really fermentation. So swamps, natural gas leaks, because natural gas is methane. Permafrost, now this is interesting. Right here is a chunk of permanently frozen soil. As we are continuing our global warming situation, we're seeing that a lot of our permafrost areas are melting. Now, for many, many years, um, we've had some materials underneath this ice and within the ice that have not decomposed because they've been frozen. Well, now that it's melting, they're, they're decomposing without oxygen. So this is a huge source of methane, um, this, these melting areas. Termites are another we've listed here, and I know that seems kind of odd, but um, termites, the way they break down the wood, they actually make uh, methane in it, and there's so many of them that I guess they consist... They, the amount that they put out is something that you could actually, you know, measure. <laughs> so anyhow, termites are there. But anthropogenic sources, so humans. If humans weren't on the planet, these wouldn't be sources. But because we are, we're... Um, <laughs> uh, so rice cultivation, we have these rice paddies that we swamp the area. And because we're creating a swamp, we have that decomposition happening without oxygen, so that is a source of, of um, 
methane, rice cultivation. Landfills, my heavens, we definitely have our landfills. So some of it will decompose at the surface where there's oxygen available, but a lot of it, you guys, is decomposing composing deep in the bowels of the landfill and there's no oxygen available so therefore you see these pipes coming up out of the you can't see it in this picture but sometimes you'll see pipes coming up out of the ground and that's venting the air and the methane that's being produced because it's decomposing without oxygen it's fermenting cows cows would not exist if humans were not on the planet we have cows exist on the planet because we like them we like our beef and so we we mass harvest these animals. We grow them and we harvest them and we grow so many we could actually fill the state of Louisiana with nothing but cows, um, no space between them. That's how many we have. Anyway, the way that they process the grains, they produce a lot of methane in their guts and so they release that. They toot, they toot methane. Biomass combustion also will produce some some methane and fossil fuel production in the process of doing that and coal mining all of these things are sources of methane and they would not um, exist if we weren't here. Next greenhouse gas nitrous oxide N2O um, we have referred in unit one as gases that contain nitrogen oxygen as NOx you can continue your your reference to that that would be fine but the natural sources there's only one natural source of this um, Nox, and that's microbes in the soil of wet tropical forests. Anthropogenic sources, though, come from fertilizers, agriculture, jet fuel, fossil fuel combustion, and sewage treatment. All anthropogenic sources of this gas. CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. There are no natural sources for this gas, and you will need to know that for a quiz, but the anthropogenic sources were coolants, aerosol propellants, and electronic cleaning solvents. No longer are they being used, they were outlawed, and you will need to know this protocol, but, but the Montreal Protocol actually prohibited the CFC use, and it wasn't due to the fact that it was a greenhouse gas and a very powerful one, it was actually due to the fact that it was depleting the ozone, which we mentioned in Unit 1. The CFCs do remain active in the atmosphere for 50 to 100 years and can continue to break down the ozone as well as act as a greenhouse gas. Super duper duper powerful. Ozone is the next one, and there are, um, ozone is the one that needs the, it's like, um, it requires the sun in order to be produced, and we talked about that with Unit 1 as an air pollutant. Um, the natural sources are the sunlight reacting with the, night, the NOx and the carbon monoxide and, and VOCs, but we talked mostly about NOx. Sunlight interactions with the NOx, and those NOx can be produced by the fossil fuels and everything, but the sunlight interacts with it and breaks apart the ozone or the oxygens, recombines it into the O3. O3 we know is a air pollutant. It breaks down our lung tissue. We talked about that before. Ozone also accumulates in the upper stratosphere and that is actually a protection area where it protects us from the UV. Why does it protect us from the UV? Friends, it's a, gene, it's a greenhouse gas, GHG. So it takes in that UV energy and converts it to heat energy. But and even though we have a ton of it up here in the stratosphere, we also know we're making it down here too. And ozone is a powerful GHG, so it will take in that energy and re-emit it as heat energy. So the anthropogenic sources of ozone, they do, it still requires the sunlight, you guys. All of these require the sunlight to interact with it, but motor vehicle exhaust, which is the burning of the fossil fuels, industrial emissions, and chemical solvents. All, when those are released, it requires the, um, produces the first, the NOx, and the VOCs and the um, CO, anyways, the, the, with the sunlight interacting with the ozone's produced. Um, I'm going to need to end this, and it's going to end in the middle. But one GHG is not the same as another GHG. Okay, they, the way that they take in that energy and the way they release it is different for each one. So one might be much more powerful than another. One might not exist in as in the quantity as another. So therefore it doesn't have as much of an impact overall. So we're going to look at those. I'm going to show you some stats. You do not have to memorize this, this particular numbers, but you do need to know like which one's the strongest. And I'll kind of draw attention to what you really need to know. 95% of the greenhouse effect is due to water vapor. 95%. That means 5% 
is due to the other greenhouse gases. And this is where I'm going to actually have to stop because this is going to stop me at 15 minutes.